Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living. Today I have a very special guest, an extraordinary story, Norman A. Woods. He is a man who has accomplished so much. He is a poet, a jazz musician, and a filmmaker for documentaries. So I'm so very, very pleased to be able to sit with him today. And he has a very, very, very busy schedule. And um, thank you. And thank you for being on the show today. How are you, Norman, today? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Great. So you have an extraordinary story to tell. And I'd like to start from the very beginning of your story, where you're from and where you started and what your life was like from the very beginning. Well, I'm from Berkeley, California, and I tell people I kind of consider myself a, a child of the free speech movement because I grew up in Berkeley when it was a very vocal and politically active environment and atmosphere. And I can remember when I was in the seventh grade, I used to go up to City Hall because in Berkeley, and sit in court sessions, because in Berkeley, uh, when you got 200 signatures for some cause of concern, they would put you on the, on the calendar. And so it didn't matter if you felt the rights of your pet was being violated, it didn't matter. If you got out there and got 200 signatures and presented it, you would get a court, you would get a day in court. So I actually watched people express concerns at a very early age because I thought that was very impressive and it was very inspirational to see that people could take their inner concerns and bring them out. And they were willing to do what was necessary to bring relevancy to that particular cause they were championing. So I grew up watching that. And I grew up, you know, with the atmosphere of UC Berkeley, there was a lot of exchange with education, spirituality, and just, uh, just that whole vocal representation of concern of how one is treated. So I grew up with a strong sense of how you treat people matters and makes the difference of how you operate in the world. Berkeley is known for, uh, in the 60s and the 70s, I mean, they really voiced their concerns. This is, they got things done. Uh, the history has shown that. It all originated from Berkeley. So you were a young man growing up there, and later on, at one point in time, uh, I understand that you started to lose your power and lose your energy, and you were going through things of would you please share that with us? Well, up to the, I mean, in the informative shaping years, I call them the shaping years, you know, as a teenager, you find your crowd of influence. You, you either, when I was coming up, it was either music and art, sports, mm -hmm. or be a militant, or be hip, slick, and cool. So my choice was I wanted to play basketball. I was too short. And I was never one that could handle a lot of put downs and, and condescension and, and just mean spirited criticism. So, the sports thing, I still love sports and I, I did that for a long time. Then I got into music because my mother was a vocalist. And so, I came from a creative environment with my mom. So, I got into music and I, I did that for quite a long time. But that quick recognition that was offered through the hip, slick, and cool. It usually has an appealing effect to most kids in the inner city. My mother left my father with, um, you know, five kids. So what happened for me, and I tell people this and to this day, is that when we have early impacts of traumatic experiences and don't get the necessary attention to find our footage, we become survivalists. Right. So at one point in time, you lost your way and you became homeless and you had your experience of, of drugs. And what point in time was that? And what was the pivotal moment that that happened? And why, looking back in hindsight, why do you think that did happen to you? Well, with the, with the drugs and the alcohol, I did it more like other teenagers did it, but I did it to cover that sense of internal conflict and the inability to connect the dots, so to say. Mm, but okay. around 1974, I felt really guilty because even though I was engaged in these slick activities and, and partying and doing what other people were doing and, and doing the drug thing, I was also in that environment, like, like you said, about Berkeley getting things done and caring. So the hypocrisy of my actions 
prompted a strong sense of guilt. So in 1975, it's about 1975, I, I had a breakdown and I just really just felt guilty for all the activities prior to. So at one last minute leading to what you were talking about was I, I sought solution that was offered by other people which ended up AKA college. So I ended up going to college and I ended up trying to identify with college students which involved more progressive drug usage and drinking and then that guilt thing came up again. I'm pretty emotional. Right. And when you don't have a place to put those raw, strong emotions, it can be overwhelming. So then I did the thing with the professional community, the uh, happy hour crowd, the suspenders, the pinstripe suits. But that inner conflict and that frustration turned into anger and I became a recluse. I didn't trust people. And then so I left the Bay Area and that's how I ended up homeless. I had made such a transition from inner city, street kid, slick, you know, to college student, teachable, making a good impression with my father, because my father was my hero. And one of the ways I impressed my father was that when my mom left, I used to go in his room and he'd be in the dark. But when I showed him a report card, he would turn on the light. So that in me, that made an impression in me that if I get good grades, I'll always see him turn on the light. Because, see, I didn't know what the image of a broken man looked like, and he was actually a broken man. And so, so when I went to college, it made him happy. And then when I became a professional and I came back, I still hadn't really resolved some of that inner conflict of, a, of forming my own identity. Yes. So let's, let's just slow it down a little bit and speak about You mentioned that there was guilt, and then you mentioned that you left the Bay Area, and then you became homeless. That pivotal moment when that happened, let me hear about that moment. What, what was that really like? Because often I think that I'm a heartbeat away from being homeless. I could be at any point. And particularly with the economy today, there's so many people that are facing those issues and they are homeless. Right. They're family, they have nobody to turn to and they find themselves homeless completely. So. Well, well what, I think, what I think happens, well, for me, was what I had built a life where I was surviving off of other people's accolades and validations, and they weren't the best forms of validation. So I got so upset with that sick form of validation that I had created mm -hmm. a dependency upon. And so the Bay Area was my problem. So I said, I'm leaving the Bay Area, and this is where the homelessness came into play. Uh, my best friend from kindergarten had moved up to Seattle with his father and he had invited me up there and I said fresh start not knowing that where you go there you are mm -hmm. so if I left the barrier with unresolved un un conflict and incomplete uh, images of myself and a degree of self dissatisfaction that came with me to Seattle so now I'm in an environment of strangers who have no vested interest in being compassionate to me or no obligation so I get up there he's the only person I know and he leaves me. He moves in with a woman. Yes. And I'm shocked. This is my best friend. This is right. a guy who I've known all of my life. Right. So now through circumstances. Through circumstances, you I'm homeless. in Seattle. I don't have any I I didn't really burn bridges here. I just pretty much right. ran I just ran all the, the good deeds that were offered to me here and the opportunities that just ran them into the ground. And that probably was in my mind because when I talked with the people before I left they said that they would have never turned their back on me, but in my mind, I didn't believe that. Okay, what I'd like to do is drop down into the feeling of that moment in time and remembering in, from memory exactly that you are just about to be homeless for the first time in your life. That must have been an incredible experience to feel and know that, that that is happening. So. Okay. Would you please share yeah. that with me? So what I did is I, I, I rented a room in the Seattle Apartment Hotels in downtown Seattle. I rented a room for like two and a half months. My friend and I was there. He was eventually moving away and starting opportunities for himself. So we got down to two weeks. We got down to two weeks before rent had to be due. Right. So then I, I'm getting scared. I'm saying, look, man, you need to help me. And he said, sure, sure, sure. Well, the long and the short of all that is he left me. And the guy who ran the hotel, he thought I was a really decent guy because I've always, I was always, I've always respected people. So he didn't, he didn't like my friend. 
So my friend tried to come back and get his stuff and slip out because he wasn't going to pay the rent. So what happened was he came back, he tried to get the stuff, and the guy said, you're not getting your stuff unless Norman's here. So anyway, I gave him his stuff. He left me. The guy felt sorry for me. He said, look, Norman, you're a decent guy. He said, I've seen what you've been dealing with with your friend. I have a storage room downstairs. Right. And this is getting toward the homeless part. So he says, if you come back here at 11 at night, you can sleep down there, but you got to be gone to, uh, by 5 in the morning before people start coming. So that's when I was really on the verge. And he did that as long as he could. And then it, it ended with him not being able to do that anymore. And at that point in time, I was enraged because I had been betrayed by somebody who I had put all my hope in mm -hmm. and I had been betrayed. So from that point, I ended up hanging out on the street with other people, going to the shelters and getting free food and doing that whole thing because I didn't have the burden of making an impression because nobody knew me. So it was easy for me to digress without it putting a lot of pressure on me. It was just survival. So I'm sensing that there is no time to even be thinking about what is going on or feeling it or That's processing. Correct. Because when you're homeless, you are actually in the process of just survival. And every moment is a hypervigilant awareness. And that awareness, you can't drop into really feeling That's true. what is happening. So That's this, exactly true. Because I didn't, right. have, I didn't have the luxury of planning because I didn't have a place to stay. I started to identify with the other strugglers, and I built, mm. a, I built a connection with them because we looked out for each other. And then it, a numbness starts to happen of, yeah. of connecting to your heart and your feelings. Yeah, you can't, you can't even afford that because you're around people who are trying to maintain, and those are the people, those are your allies. So there's a brotherhood and there's a kinship of fellow survivors. Okay, so I'd like to speak about when people are looking at you, perhaps you were sitting on the sidewalk or they could see you was homeless with other homeless people. And what was that feeling like? That My sense is that I have passed so many homeless people on the streets in so many cities. And what I do is I stop, I look in their eyes, I greet them, <coughs> I say, hello, how are you? I, and I stay with them and share with them with their eyes. And if it's appropriate, I sometimes hug them. And then if, 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 and if I have money, I will give them some money. But the beginning part, before I give them the money, I think it's so important that that connection is there. Because what I'm thinking is that most people in society, they're going to get nervous. They're going to try and, and reject what they're seeing in front of them because that could be them. They don't want to deal with that. Right. You can't deal with it as being a homeless person, and then the viewer is there looking at a homeless person, and they can't deal with it because it's bringing up feelings that they can't even deal with yeah. inside of themselves. So the only way that the passerby can handle it is look away, pretend that that homeless person is not there. And I think this is not an answer. In my mind, it is about connecting and feeling that. Feel your own energy that it could be you. And, it, and there is a homeless person there. And that could be your brother. That could be your sister. That could be your close little community that you love. You so it's not, it's not us and them. It's all of us. We're all together in all of this. And this is not a woo-woo talk here or an airy-fairy talk. This is what is happening here on the planet. And, this is, and until we get this right, and until we understand that, who are we as a human race here? You see, you see them struggle to reach you. When, they're, when you're out there, you actually see everyone from the quick drop in the hand, the quick, hey, you need some money, here, mm -hmm. take this, and zoom, zoom. And you, and you, see, you see them struggle to want to connect with you. There are people who want to connect with you, and that's one of the things that made an impact on me. Luckily, my circumstance wasn't my identity, so therefore I had the skills to see people making that attempt to reach me. I even seen a couple of smiles. Well, share with me you know, what that I, connection I, would be like if they pass by. Well, one, one time a girl, she, she smiled at me, 
But at first I thought she was smiling at me to see if I was safe. But I smiled back and I said, how you doing? And then she said, I'm doing okay, but how are you doing? And so once we made that connection that I was approachable and that I wasn't suffering any uh, violent outbursts or potential mental illness of some sort, mm -hmm. dialogue began. And I'm a strong advocate of the fact that it only take three sentences. It only take two to three sentences of sincerity to really see that the humanity has not been diminished in that individual. Beautiful. And I was one of those people. And so, so uh, the girl, we started talking and stuff, and, and, and just a brief moment of my humanity came back when I started explaining to her that my life wasn't always like this. And that took like five minutes. And how long were you homeless in Seattle area or in other year. places? Year. So the entire experience was a year long. Yeah, a year. A year that felt like five. And I, heroin? The drug of heroin came in uh, at what point? Cocaine, uh, heroin, you know, smoking, smoking. I don't like needles. Um, cocaine, mostly alcohol, because alcohol was more accessible. Was that in the fold of being homeless during that year? Well, yeah, because in Seattle it rains a lot. It mm -hmm. rains a lot. It's wet. Mm -hmm. And so you want to... Uh, you will accept any altered state except the pain of your disposition. Any altered state where you can create a delusion of I'm okay, you'll take that. You know, even though part of you knows you're not okay, even though part of you knows your situation is unbearable, even though you know that, you know, it's easy to talk about neurosis, but it's harder to talk about the possibility of making a change, especially if you don't feel you have any resources. Not only have you felt abandoned by society, but you felt abandoned of your best qualities. You've given up on yourself. So any reach is felt in full potential. So like I said, when this girl said this, it took me a few minutes before I told her, I went into my whole deal of, you know, I always, my situation wasn't like this, and I started explaining it to her, and I actually ran her off. Yeah, and it was so, it was very important for her to make that connection to yeah, you. Yeah, but I gave her too much. I mean, I, 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 I didn't have, you don't have the luxury of balance. You know, mm -hmm. you get an open door and then you, you don't just go, thank you very much. I'll take some more. You don't do that. You just give the whole, you just throw your whole diatribe on them because you, you, you're so, you're unconsciously, desperately seeking attentive ears and you don't really know it until you start spilling your whole circumstance. So over a period of time, I learned to just give moderate amounts of information and let them lead the way with their concern. See, they were trying to give me concern and my disposition just overpowered it. So I learned to just let them come a little at a time, let them be nice, uh, let them invite me to lunch and turn it down. Uh, thank you, I'm okay, and, and... Not overly needy, just, that's right. just still had right. a certain sense of right. self that you weren't as desperate as you were. Well, what I chose to balance do... Balance it. That's right. What I chose to do, and I remember this very clearly, any time I had an encounter that reminded me of my brighter moments, I treated it like a glass of water. I didn't guzzle it down. I sipped it. And slowly but surely, I start getting pictures of you're angry, you're hurt, but you're capable. It took a long time. Don't, I'm not saying it took an overnight thing. I start separating, putting myself on trial, verdict guilty before trial starts with possibility. So for every time somebody treated me like a human being, I stuffed it like, like a little squirrel. I stuffed it in my little sack of possibility. And eventually I was able to create dialogue. But then things got worse and then I had to separate things are getting worse but that doesn't diminish the work you've done to stay connected to your humanity. So I protected my humanity like a piece of art in a museum. I protected it, even though I couldn't do nothing about it. So then I got to a point How where... How does one protect the humanity? Their humanity? Mm -hmm. By letting their self know that this present circumstance is now. Your accomplishments are yours and no one can never take them away from you. Mm. And so it's your dignity, your humanness, your, yeah. the, the beauty of you, the, yeah. the goodness of you. The goodness, that's right, the, the goodness. The simple, basic goodness of you. Yes, yes. And, and to, yes. When you say protect, perhaps the word would be that you focused on that and you remembered that and you, you cherished it 
where, where was the protection? What did you need to protect it from, from the, what? The negative narrative that's reinforced by people's disdain. When people look down at you and people are being mean and being cruel, that's, that becomes the enemy because you don't want them to depict your reality. And that's why I said everybody has a story. So they would be challenging and not, yeah, I perhaps they would not be it. seeing your basic goodness. Right. So therefore you have a sense that you would have to protect that by yeah. saying, by focusing on it and keeping it to yourself at that moment in time, because right. that's all you had at that right. moment. Right, and I'm constantly, I'm constantly displaying vigilance to reconvince myself that I haven't misused or lost it. So I'm, they don't know that I'm Beautiful. fighting to hold on to it. Beautiful. I'm fighting to hold on to it because there are doubtful moments. People have mm -hmm. doubtful moments. That's why I said you can talk to a person and you guys can talk about the pains and the, the negativities easily. That conversation is easy, but when you want to talk about stepping out of the box and mustering up courage in, the, in unforeseen circumstances, that conversation starts to get very small. Yes. So I had to protect it from my own uh, uh, discount because I said I was guilty, self-pity, you know. There's nothing more, I can, this, this sentence will make it clear for you. There's nothing more painful than knowing better and not doing better. And nobody added to that. I sat with that. When I thought things were working well for me, a week or two later, I'm sleeping in the bushes at St. James Cathedral. I'm sick, you know. I'm not having medical coverage. And what about that girl who was nice? What about that guy who said, here, have a sandwich? My father used to always say, don't mix apples and oranges. So what those people did for me gave me a moment of clarity. And I protected that moment of clarity with the hopes that it would come again. So after I was home, when I was sleeping in the bushes at St. James Cathedral, at that point in time, I was pretty delirious and I was talking to myself. And because things, when things were not connecting, I started getting discouraged. Because like I said, mm -hmm. one step forward, trauma, conflict, challenging situations, two steps back. So after Seattle and the homelessness for a year and the drugs, did you stop the drugs completely at, at the end of the year or did that no. linger on for a number no. of No. What happened time? what happened was I was sleeping in the bushes at St. James Cathedral on Capitol Hill and I was I was grabbing my religious roots and I was saying, Oh, they said church is a house of God and so I'm gonna sleep in his yard. That's how I was talking to myself. I was mm -hmm. saying I'm sleeping I felt like I was sleeping in this God's yard and that I needed to be close to the source where I could receive help. Well, unfortunately, the sky didn't open up. I got sick because it was raining, and I almost, I almost died of pneumonia, and I got sick. So I went down to Pioneer Square, and I, and I went to every homeless shelter, and I begged them for a bed. That's what I did. I begged them for a bed. I went to a place called Lutheran Compass Center. I begged the guy for a bed. I told him, I said, look, I have a background. I have a I have a resume. I had jobs. I'm just bad luck has just. And they come. had no bed to give you. Well, he said, "I'll give you a bed," but I didn't hear him because I, I, I just, oh, okay. I could not. Afford, I had been turned okay. down at Union, at Union Gospel Bread of Life. I had been turned down. Mm -hmm. I just could not afford a no, so I just kept telling him every aspect of why I would be mm -hmm. a worthy investment to give a bed. And, and he literally had said, yeah, probably about 10 minutes ago. And I have still pleaded my case because I just, I just, there's that part of the human spirit that just refuses to die. And that was mine. I said, you just got to get me a bed. And it was $2.25 a night for a bed, $1.25 for a locker, and people would donate food. So you get these plates of food with snowball cupcakes and, and some kind of vegetable you never seen because they just, put it all together, but that was my, my that was my, you know, right. and, and um, how it came back to the Bay Area was I went to 14, I went to 13 temporary agencies throughout Seattle, because what I told the guy at the Lutheran Compass Center is I said, all I need is a bed and a shower, because see, what we were talking about earlier, I knew my bright moments would come back. Right, well, Norman, it's been said that once you get to the streets and you become a street person, the hardest journey would be to come back to where you were at one point in time. So what was that moment in time that you actually came back from the homelessness, from the drugs? My son. 
I had a crinkled up picture of my son, my oldest son, Dustin, my oldest son, Dustin. And I, I would pray every night and I'd look at his picture and I looked at his crumpled up picture. I used to keep it in my back pocket. And I said, I got to give this one more try mm -hmm. for my son. I got to give, my, my father, I had, my and father, my father, <laughs> my father was a non give up guy. My father did, would not give up. He struggled with us, but he would never give up. So on what us. did you do? Did you stop the drugs and did Well, become, what I did homeless? is I stopped I stopped the unethical and unmoralistic behavior that I was demonstrating out on the street like every other street person, mm -hmm. hustler, homeless person. And I went to thirteen temporary agencies throughout Seattle and I applied for jobs. And one job I got a job rolling tarp at Husky Field where you roll the little tarp okay. outside and you're still homeless while yep. you're doing this job i'm living in well i'm living in the lutheran compass center with my little bed okay and i'm going out and i get a job so i get a check for like 35 dollars. i go to st vincent de paul i buy a pair of slacks because i'm working off a handful of hope and a handful of self-esteem mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and i and so i buy these slacks and i buy a, a shirt with somebody's initials this is how fragmented my self-esteem was my ability to choose a quality shirt was reflected through picking a shirt that had initials. <laughs> I figured if somebody put a monogram on it, it must be a good shirt. But that was my rationale. Yes. And I bought the shirt, and I went back to, to the uh, Lutheran Compass Center. I took a razor blade and cut his initials off, and I bought a big, fat Pierre Cardin tie. It was, like, really wide. But that was where my self-esteem was. I had a, a monogram shirt, somebody else's monogram shirt, a big bozo to clown, six inch wide Pierre Cardin, because that was like the first designer out. So I, I, I felt some esteem and then I, and I got a job. So there's an expression called fake it until you make it. So basically, you, if you would look like it outside, perhaps the inside would catch up, hopefully. Well, my, my motto was drill it until you feel it. Drill it till you feel it? Yes, keep putting it in there until you feel it. And so I did, and so I, I put a resume together and I got a job handed out at a temporary agency, handing out flyers for a woman's shoe store. They said, we got a job, but it's handing out flyers for a woman's shoe store. I now, said, what I'll about drugs it. while these uh, jobs are going on? Did you slowly I'm wean drinking. yourself off of it, or did you stay full blown drinking. with it? Uh, no, I'm still drinking. Well, heroin, because no. it's a very Stop. difficult drug to get yeah, off of. Yeah, I, I cold turkeyed off of that. Really? Yeah, I cold turkeyed off of that. No methadone, no? No. And because mm. uh, uh, it didn't have me as much as it had a lot of okay. people. But the drinking was your forte. The drinking and the smoking weed and the cocaine okay. and, and the pills. And so I got a and job. And that's easier to get, drinking than, than yeah. heroin. Yeah, you'll so always find somebody. You're well, always you, going to find liquor somewhere. Yeah. Well, you're always going to find somebody who wants to commiserate misery with you. <laughs> so all yes. you got to do is know where yeah. they are. So mm -hmm. I got this, I got, they asked me, did I want to do this job handing out flyers to a woman's shoe store? And yes. so I said, sure. And so with my little tie, and my little slacks, and my resume, I handed out flyers for a women's shoe store, and I waited for any woman to be nice like those that woman I told you about earlier. Yes. When they asked the question, I said, they said, don't, don't you feel funny handing out flyers to a women's shoe store? I said, well, are they hiring over there where you are? And they said, well, I don't know. You got a resume? I said, sure, right here. So mm -hmm. as I was handing out flyers, I had resumes. I had like 13 copies of our resume, and any woman, because I figured if they were a secretary or something, that they would know the inside scoop. So I was slowly building my way back. So then I made the long short of all that as I came back here. I got enough money to come back. I called my dad, and I said, look, man, I'm ready to get back on track because this is just too much. And he was really happy. So I got back to the Bay Area. Me and him connected. I was still drinking. But I was feeling a little bit of hope. And so I thought that me and him was about to connect. This was the point that we were going to have that father-son talk. And I would be able to one day tell my son, look, I've been through the darkness of the dark. And this is how I came through it in the mature talk. So that's the father-son talk I expected to have. But my father died four months later. So you had been through the dark of the dark. And yeah. now you're in the light. So let's fast forward here and talk about the transition from the dark to the light and all of the creativity you've done now since being in the light. You've okay. done incredible documentaries. You're an incredible accomplished uh, musician for jazz. You're a poet. You have so much to offer and you have been offering. You have a whole copulation of so much of creativity that you have done. You have not done that when you were in the vein of, of being homeless because there's no place to do it. 
uh, but now in the last years you're accomplishing all that and you found a spiritual practice that is very very meaningful to you about eight years ago yeah well what happened was like I said I got back my dad died and I felt like that was the lowest that one could go mm -hmm. but through various readings and teachings I came to the realization that I had to experience a kind of death for a rebirth Absolutely. And so when my father passed away, I did not really care because there was not a man on this planet that I respected more than I expected my father. So I had to do a piecemeal definition of male role models to talk to and connect to your father, what I saw on TV, any place I could see a father loving their child. I just act like the, the little deer, that just the little puppy who was looking for a home. And so I, I did that for a long time because I had to build an image of the man that I was aspiring to become because I had to have direction. So the spiritual stuff and the drinking and the not doing all that, really it would have been hard to overpower that if I hadn't had some model of where I was heading. Right. And so I was heading to be a father to my son. So when I got back, my dad died two or three years later. I just felt like I was back homeless again, one step forward, two steps back, one step forward, three steps back. But then I, I didn't die. But today in this moment, where are you at with your claiming your own power and being with yourself of your... Well, I got into a, um, what, I, what I did was I, I, I got into a, a um, group of people uh, and recovery, and I recovered from drugs and alcohol. How long ago was that? 22 years. 23 years? 22. 22 years 22 ago. 22 years, I surrendered. I just, I just, the good in me, I'll tell you, as, as weird as this might sound to some people, the good in me said, I'm still with you. Seriously. The basic goodness The goodness in, you. in me and said, the simple basic I have goodness. not given up on you. Yes. I have not given up on you. The negative narrative has had its turn. So I think it's my turn to let you know that I haven't given up on you. I, divine, I define that as some type of divine intuition of me protecting my goodness. And now it was time for my goodness to reemerge and say, now it's my turn to show you that I'm still with you. And slowly but surely, I discarded anything that was negative. I discarded any people that were negative. I start connecting to proactive people. I start talking to people who are optimistic. I was talking to people who just refused to be held down by the negative narrative. And slowly but surely, the negative narrative got its walking papers and the, the papers of positive affirmation and rebuilding came in, mm. and that's the conversation that I had with myself. Norman, I've heard this over and over, the story that it's incommensurative to the people who have walked in the bowels of hell, in the darkness, and they are now in the light. They are great saints, they are great masters, they are great teachers today. This has happened throughout many, many, many centuries, and it continues to happen today. It's almost like as much as the dark that you experience, as much as the light you're going to experience. This is, it seems to go hand in hand. Uh, we've heard the story over and over. There was people just about to commit suicide, mm -hmm. and uh, Eckhart Tolle, mm -hmm. um, um, the woman who wrote Loving What Is, mm -hmm. uh, Byron Katie. She was at the moment, she was on her knees, and very, very in the darkest place. She. She couldn't stand her life. Everybody knows the story of her. But at that pivotal moment, in, from that darkness, now look what she's creating. Now look who she is. And now look at the man who you are today. It's wow. amazing. So that dark night of the soul can really serve us, or it could kill us. Kill us. Well, it didn't succeed at killing me. And a lady, I had people, and I talk about this in, in certain interviews, I had people that came and gave me little doses of goodness and reminded me. I had a lady told me, she came up to me, I was working because I always had gotten jobs. I was still drinking. She came up to me and put her hand on mine and she said, you're a good man, Norman. I don't care what you think. You're a good man. I have a gift for you. And she gave me some little metal, miraculous metal thing and she said, 
this will keep the darkness from you. Was that meaningful to you at that moment when this woman gave yeah, you this? Yeah, because it, it went straight to it went straight to my heart. I was so you was, needed that at I that moment. I was so egoless and in balance that when there's no push and no pull and there's no overindulgence or, or repression, you're at a place where things can come straight to your heart. So when she said that to me, I was speechless. I didn't have any comeback. I just accepted it. I wore that medal for 18 years, never took it off. It was gold medal, and I wore it every day to remind me to never give up on the goodness that I had been reintroduced to. So I made a conscious commitment that everything I collected in my life to reaffirm the goodness that had never abandoned me, but I had abandoned, that I was going to go out and I was going to remind people of their good moments. I wanted the people who were on the verge of quitting. I didn't want, if you got it together, I don't got nothing for you, okay, more power to you. But I wanted that guy who was sitting in his house with a gun in his mouth, ready to say, why should I care? And I wanted him 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes and I'll show you why you care. Well, show me. Why should, why should he care? Why what should, 10 minutes? What would you say in that 10 minutes to him? Give me an overview of that. I, first of all, I would ask them what matters to them. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people just want to be heard. A lot of times people want to be heard. There are real simple things that you could do that are so powerful that we just disregard and, and, and think is mindless. Helping a person feel like they matter, you can do that in five minutes. You mm -hmm. can laugh with them. You can give them a hug. You can say, did you see that? Anything that reminds that person. And if you don't reach them, worst case scenario, on that level, because they are so comatose into that which they're fixated on, which was numbed up and completely don't want to hear anything, don't want to feel anything, and you can't reach it with just that, what you said. Well, What's your backup plan to well, that? Well, I'm a strong advocate, non-negotiable, that said from the heart reaches the heart. The heart that, reaches the heart. That's right. I, I don't. That's non-negotiable with me. I believe that. Totally. I, I, I don't care I like if you're on medication or not. I don't care. What's there from the heart will reach the heart. I'm, 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 that's non-negotiable. A person, I don't care how many PhDs they have, how much they want to debate with facts. I don't care about none of that. I know. The basic simplicity of heart to heart. It will reach people. It will reach them because they got a heart because they're sitting there before you. There's no magic switch. Mm. There's no magic switch. There is a connection that if you look at somebody, absence of fear, absence of overindulgence, absence of prejudgment, absence of all of that, yes. it will take you five minutes. And that person, I met a guy, I wrote a poem called What Comes From the Mouth of a Fool. And this is a true story. I'm walking down Powell Street. I'm thinking there are no problems worse than the ones I'm going through. I'm just going through it. I'm just, oh, nothing's mad working for me, and I'm just frustrated, and I'm trying to do all the right things, and nothing's connecting. I see this guy. He has a blue Air Force coat on. He's got a beat-up McDonald's cup, and he's standing in front of McDonald's, and he says, I don't want to bother you, but he said, you got a little change? He said, I don't mean to disrespect. I mean, he went overboard to let me know that he wasn't trying to bother me. And I said, look, man, you ain't bothering me. And I said, here, and I gave him about five bucks. I said, and then I walked down the street and I turned around. And he said, man, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bother you. I said, no, 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 wait a minute, chief. I said, let's go get something to eat. And he said, man, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't try to, I'm not trying to be slick. I said, it's not about you. I said, would you give me some of your time? And at that moment, he reassessed, this guy wants to, me to give him some of my time. And help him to connect he to himself at that, that moment. Exactly. And do you know Beautiful. and do you know in the hour we spent, he was one of the first black pilots of Air Force One. And that Air Force jacket he was and I, I do get a little emotional about this. <clears throat> that Air Force jacket he was wearing reminded him of the heightened quality of his life. I can't remember the president, but as I'm talking to this guy and he's telling me the story and he's telling me these slits on the side of his eye came from being a POW and he's showing me where he got tortured. And I'm saying, here this guy is, somebody who I could have looked up to and aspired to accomplish and I got that gift because I asked him for his time 
And I went home. I said, there's no way that I'm going to let this experience rest. So I went home and I wrote a poem called What Comes From the Mouth of a Fool. Well, would you share it with me? Or a line or two of it at least. I speak for the disregarded voices of the unheard. If you're knowledgeable, well-spoken, and good with yourself, that I probably have nothing I can offer you. You know, um, that's how it starts. Um, I can't remember a line right now because I'm thinking about the story. I'm beautiful. thinking about his face. Seriously, beautiful. I'm not one of those poets that memorize stuff. That's beautiful. But I, 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 I think about that guy. I, I had to, I had to, it just, I had to, I had to immortalize him. I had to. That's why I wrote a poem about him. I speak for the voices unheard. If you are knowledgeable, worldly, real deep, and somewhat sure about yourself, then you probably know more than I can tell you. If you are pissed off at your own folks and just can't find your way out of desperity for some misdirected need for cultural approbation, while in the meantime, unbeknown to you, of course, you keep looking for your freedom in all the wrong places, ignoring your instinct would prevail what is true in a fake smile from the wrong faces. And you just can't help it. You still keep trying to fool everybody. Then I can't help you. And so, who might you ask, am I? Maybe just another fool who has been lost in a crowd of humanity that has returned from the brink of insanity. And if you don't think that I stand for something, you might be right. But that doesn't mean that I'll fall for anything. But how would you know? Well, with nothing more to lose but potential conversation to gain, I will take my chance and ask if I might be able to make a couple of small suggestions. Just a couple. Breathe. Step back and try to remember. Self-acceptance isn't a bad thing. It really isn't. But it will take more than hostile force to make it believable. With loving support constantly reinforced, can make it perceivable. Replace talking at and about each other with talking to each other. So how about that? Now, if this hasn't provided you with an acceptable level of entertainment, I'm not sorry, because it wasn't meant to. Oh, and me? Maybe I might just be a fool who has been lost in a crowd called humanity, trying to return from the brink of insanity, or maybe not. I guess I'll just continue my cause to speak for the disregarded voice of the unheard. But I wonder, how willing are you to listen? about him so much is that he accomplished so much, he did so much in his life, there he is homeless, and everybody's ignoring him, and all of a sudden that moment in time, you met up with him, and you did not ignore him, you, you start sharing with him, and, show, and bringing the humanity back to him, looking at his basic goodness, and looking at his heart, the connection to him, I and that asked, was a pivotal moment in time yeah, for you. I asked him for his time. And so he had the opportunity to say, is my time worth something or not? This young man who's looking together mm -hmm. asked me for my time. And so he had the opportunity right there to say. So you must have turned his head around he, completely. He, he, he looked at why. me. I mean, he looked at me yes. and that heart to heart, I didn't see the scars until he started telling me about them. I didn't see the mm -hmm. things in his fingernails until he started telling me about them. Then I saw that his coat was not just an overcoat from the Goodwill. 
He had stripes on it and everything. And so to me, that let me know he had had a grasp upon one of his bright moments. And I felt honored. I met a black hero, in my opinion. I met a guy who had aspired in the military to be entrusted at one of the highest levels you could be entrusted. And here I would have never known that. And I told him he was doing me a favor because I was the one kicking, kicking cans and feeling all crazy. I wasn't going to buy redemption. If I give a homeless person money, I'm not trying to buy redemption and reacquaint myself with my goodness. Or feel better because you're doing exactly. it. Exactly. I don't do it for that. Right. I remembered how it felt to be out there. But right. he, it was something about the way he felt he didn't want to bother me. And I said, Norman, is what you going through so important that a man in this position can sacrifice his need for my comfort and not bother me? I said, that's something, because I knew when I walked a couple of feet past him, I said, there's something up here. Hmm. Ain't no way in the world that man can afford the luxury of trying to assure me that he's not bothering me. There's something to this guy. So let's go back to, I asked you about a man who is in his home alone with a gun and you would have that five, 10 minutes with him and you mentioned all the things you did, what else would you do? There's many viewers here that are going to be listening to this talk that we're okay. having here. And they are perhaps thought about in the past or they're thinking about in the present. Some people may be even thinking that that is a solution for the future. And I must say that the way I see it of suicide, and I know this is going to be a big one, but everybody says, oh my God, how can you talk about that? Oh my God, this is guilt. This is something terrible. You're not supposed to do that because you're hurting all your loved ones. Well, I don't believe all that. I think suicide is the right for the people to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And it's their life. They own their life. I own my life. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell me what I can do or can't do. But if I, have a, if I am totally imbalanced at that moment via through drugs or mental disorders or, or something and I'm reaching out so I may think I want to do suicide at that moment and I'm confused. Well, I think it's great, absolutely, that you can get counseling through great therapy or connection to your loved one or connection to family, also connection to self. But I'm also an advocate in the same way as I can say that, that I believe that suicide is somebody's right, such as in Holland when you are also sick and very you have three daughters and they say that you're incurable in america we it's not doable here so there's a humanity to that and right. it's a choice that we can do that but there's a clear distinction between if you have mental confusion and you may be just upset because my saying is that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem right I, so we yeah. really have to look at that. And, yeah. and I absolutely, absolutely agree with you about the humanity of connecting to the heart at that moment. And if that person is connected to somebody from that heart level, definitely hope they, you have their whole attention. Hope can be born. And hope arises. Hope can be born. Thank hope you. Hope can be born. Thank you, Norman. And, and that's why I said I, I don't have a quick fix you know, answer for, for that, but I know what my experience has taught me is meaningful dialogue consists of what matters. Mm -hmm. And if you give a person the opportunity to tell you what matters, they may say some crazy stuff to see if you're really concerned. They may some, to say some stuff to see if you really mean what you say or, or a con job. They may do all that, but when you don't budge or react and you're still looking at them like, no, I really want to know what matters to you then things change, it gets real. Yes. Because for me, what happened to me and those who I help, I find out, I let them know, no, this is not about me. I'm not analyzing you. I really wanna know what matters to you because your true incentive is gonna come from the established worth of what matters to you. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a sense of purpose and what matters to you. And we got plenty of time to talk about me, but right now, let's put you on the playing field by which we can have meaningful dialogue. And meaningful dialogue doesn't come from me doing well and you doing bad. It has to do with a respectable exchange 
of our interpreting the value of our experiences. So if a guy is sitting at home with a gun in his mouth, the first thing I'm going to tell him is I'm going to say, man, can you just put that off for just like maybe a couple of hours? Can you give me a couple of hours before you do that? And they'll say, well, what you mean? What, you, what can you accomplish in a couple of hours? I said, well, we'll just let me know if you do that for me first, you know, and, and, and he'll look at me like I'm crazy. Like I'm saying, well, just, just, a couple, just give me a couple of hours. And if I can get him to stop and not blow his head off for a couple of hours, a couple of hours is a milestone to have meaningful dialogue. That's a lot of time. You give me two hours. If somebody is willing to give you two hours and they're already on this path of self-destruction, there's some care there. Because if there wasn't some care there, they wouldn't give you two hours. Well, I know that you are creating a website, and this website is you want to connect to all the people across the entire planet via the website mm -hmm. that these people can share their stories My of that moment in time and through that unity of, of, of that connection to each other. Because it, it, I have been talking to a number of people who have thought about suicide in the past, and obviously they did not. So I was able to speak to them and they shared this with me that when they spoke to a person, another person who wasn't thinking about suicide, that person couldn't understand them. But they found the camaraderie between another person who basically thought about suicide. So there's something about that. And where they were able to talk to somebody who was contemplating that and thinking that, then they knew that they were really understood. Because they are talking to a person who has a, a, an understanding of diminished value. They're talking to a person who has sunk to the inner depths of no concern. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a process. My movie, Journey from the Inside, is about being free from the negative narrative that represses one and makes hope unreachable. So my film, and so when I did the film and I did the website that you're referring to, what I want to do is I want to reach out and ask people to do like that guy did on Powell Street. I want people to reach out and tell me what matters to them. What matters? Because my story is just one. People can say, oh, I've never been homeless. Oh, I've never did, been a hustler or whatever. They can say all the disqualifying and I'll never factors. Be. Yeah, they can say all the disqualifying factors mm -hmm. that they want to. But when they're alone, they're telling themselves the real truth. So I'm trying to create a forum by which they can share with me what matters and we can have meaningful dialogue. I already got the website up. I spent a lot of money on my film, and I, I have another film, Mystic Dance, which keeps doing what I'm doing. Mystic Dance is from a poem, Mystic Dance for a Mover of, of, of Souls. And the dance we do when we're extending that care that you and I are talking about, I call it a dance, you know? I can give you a lines to that one, because that's one of my ones that keeps me going, and, and I reach and cannot touch, I ache but cannot feel. Hopeless, waiting for the hopeful, sparingly, is this my chance to heal? Genesis rising brings optimism to the young and for the old, for the warrior of love has now returned, my friend, a true mover of souls. So that, see, I can give you that poem, I don't know why, that one, that's the one that reminds me that you and me, we have to create this meaningful dialogue. It's better that they talk to somebody else than sitting there talking to themselves, you know? And, Absolutely. And so, so, so the website. What is the website name? Journey from the Inside Movie. Journey from the Inside. My name. Dot com. Dot org. Yeah. Dot com, and it's inside n s i d e. The n is for Norman. The side is inside because my truth comes from that goodness that never gave up on me, and it's constantly reinforcing the belief that I got work to do. And, I, and I, I, like I said, anybody want to talk to me for 10 minutes and try to discover the meaningful dialogue and personal value, I got some for them. I'm, I'm opening myself to the world. I'm opening myself up to the world because I've been to the edge and it doesn't give me some right or specialty. I know what it's like to not care. And the world needs this yeah. very, very much. I know, it needs you, Norman. Yes, I know what it's like to not care and learn to care and somewhere in those travels I'm sure I got something for somebody. My sister says in the movie, mm. my sister says in the movie, Journey from the Inside at the very end, she says, Norman will talk to 50 people and if he sees one of those people two or three weeks down the road and they say they're doing better, 
my brother Norman will sleep good. He will sleep good knowing. See, because I live to inspire. I'm fully committed. I'm fully committed. I, at the end of my movie, I say, the gift is in the giving. Thank you. That was so beautiful. About eight years ago, you came across your spiritual practice. Uh, let's talk about your teacher, uh, incredible teacher. Oh, the the study. Pema children. Yeah, well, I'm not I'm not as much of an authority as a lot of people who may have been committed to the teachings. But what's your experience? My experience was reading her walking, books and... walking through fear, yes. walking through fear, and how to maintain egolessness when things fall apart. That was my saving grace. I, I learned so much from when her. When was the first moment that you came across her book? or books. She has so many books, but which yeah. book did you come across and how did you find her book? I knew about falling apart. So her title was perfect for me. <laughs> I knew I knew how it felt because I had yes. said earlier about one step forward, two steps back, one step forward. Mm -hmm. My father, if he was alive today, one of the things he would tell you about his son Norman, he'd say, my son Norman, he said, the boy walked down the street kicking cans with his head down. He'll sit in the room for three days. But for some reason or another, after three or four days, he come flying out that room with a vigor for life like none I've ever seen because that's how I am. Always down. I, I can be down but never out. Norman, we just have a few moments, and it's been an incredible conversation. I'd like to know what final thoughts you have that you would like to share with others or anything that comes from your heart at this moment in time? There are no changes in life that can't be built from a handful of hope. I've been there, I've done that. I have armfuls and bucketfuls now and I started with a handful of hope. Try to remember at some point in your life where it wasn't dominated by the negative narrative one moment where you remember a true, sincere smile, one of those smiles that you feel from the tip of your toe to the last hair on your head. Well, I don't have any hair today. But just try to remember, do yourself a favor, because if you're not going now, there's a purpose. There's a purpose waiting for you. There's a purpose within you waiting to be re-invited back into the forefront of your consciousness. It waits patiently. Pain has had its turn. It's done its deal. Now it's time for the sunlight of the spirit to do the dance, the mystic dance, the one that moves souls. And I will be your music conductor without a doubt. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute honor and absolute joy to be sitting with you and speaking with you. And I look forward to many conversations in the future. Thank you. I Thank you, Norman. Got a little excited, but you know, that's how I go. Oh, no, no. You'll Perfect. See, you'll see my poetry. I'm around. <laughs> Thank you, Norman. All right. And do take care of yourselves. And thank you from the Art of Conscious Living. <laughs>